Today is cluster time. I'm going to be setting up a hyper-converged Proxmox cluster using three older dual Xeon servers I have here. I'm going to be setting it up with Ceph, so that way if any node fails, I still have all the storage data that is accessible. It'll be set up with high availability in Proxmox, so if any node fails, that VM that was running can be restarted quickly on another node. And I'm going to be using a 10 gigabit mesh network, so if any of my network links fails, it'll just continue doing it with very limited downtime, and I also don't need a network switch. Let's take a look at the nodes I'm going to be using today. These are all used servers of dual socket Xeon systems, which I have with different generations in all of them. This is not an optimal cluster setup, and it would be much better to have the same node on all of these systems, so that way they have an equal amount of computing power. All of these systems also have two terabytes total of SSD storage. Another important part of any cluster is having high-speed networking between all nodes. Let's take a look at the back of these servers and how I'm going to connect them. Here I am at the back of the server so I can plug in all the connections I need to make these servers work. These servers will have three different types of connections going to them. The first type is going to be power, just to power all of these systems. And then the next type will be a 1 gigabit ethernet connection. There's just a standard ethernet connection and it's going to an unmanaged switch. And this is for things like management and VM communication, which don't really need high speed or low latency. For the high speed networking, I'm going to be using a mesh of 10 gigabit ethernet connections. And that basically means each of these nodes talks to the other node with a 10 gigabit network connection. And they need a two port 10 gigabit net to do that. And you kind of get like a triangle with the three servers and then those three NICs, one connecting each server to the other server. And the advantage of this configuration is you don't need a network switch, so that removes a point of failure and often an expensive part for these high-speed connections. And any of these links can fail, and it still has all the data going, and any of the nodes can fail, and the other two nodes can still communicate. And thanks to QSFP Tech for providing the three network cables I need to connect to all of these servers. One cool thing with SFP Plus and QSFP connectors and other similar types is you can do a lot of different types of cables connecting them. In this sort of setup, I'm probably going to go with a DAC cable or direct attached copper. These are very cheap and affordable cables, and you can just easily run them between two different nodes in a rack and not have much extra cable laying around, and it's a very affordable solution. Here I have the two modules and a fiber optic cable connected to do a 10 gigabit base SR connection. Fiber can be great for longer connections, especially very high speed connections. The last type of connector I'm going to be using is these converters to 10 gigabit base T, which uses these RJ45 cables. This can be great if you have other equipment that uses 10 gig base T that you want to connect to it, or 2.5 and 5 gigabit base T, which are getting common on a lot of new like desktops and laptops. It also lets you use existing RJ45 cable you might have in like a patch panel going through a wall so you don't have to run a fiber optic cable. All the hardware side of things is all done now. I got all the cables connected, I got all the link lights blinking, and I got all the fans roaring. Now that I got the hardware working, I'm going to go over how I set this up in software, some of the features of having a cluster, and then go over some of the performance and demos of failures on the cluster. So first, how did I set up the cluster? First thing I did is just have to connect all the nodes together. I went under the data center cluster, create cluster, and then join information. Now that the cluster is created and all the nodes are together, you can see all the multiple nodes here ready to be managed. And then I had to install Ceph. So if you click on each node, you can go under Ceph and just easily download it on here. Luckily, Proxmox makes setting up Ceph super easy. Setting up Ceph with their full command line can get a bit more complicated, but it's probably still a good idea to know a lot of those commands, because getting the most out of a distributed file system like Ceph requires kind of knowing how it works under the hood. But if you want to do a super simple deployment, you need to set up enough monitors and managers for it to happen. The simple terms is these nodes make sure all the data is on the different devices and where that data is. And then there's the OSD devices. There's one OSD for each of the drives, in this case the SSDs in the system, and these actually store the data. By default, it's kind of like a RAID 10, but instead of having mirrors of drives, it's mirrors of servers with drives inside them. So I have three servers, each have all the same data, and each of these servers have an array of SSDs that kind of run in RAID 0, because they all have different data. But because the other servers actually have a copy of the same data, two of the other nodes can fail and all the data is fine. And since there's no single point of failure in Ceph, that means multiple drives or nodes could fail depending on how the cluster is configured, with no loss of actual data and it just keeps working as normal. A disadvantage of Ceph and other distributed file systems is there's a whole lot more going on with these solutions than simple RAID or just having a single drive. And that all requires CPU cycles and other processing events. 
So that means a lot more processing is required for you to get data over Ceph compared to having like a local ZFS or EXT4 storage, which typically means it's gonna be slower. But let's go over the networking now and how I got all these nodes connected. So that 10 gigabit mesh network I created earlier is a circle. And normally the general rule of thumb with networking is don't make circles because the packets kind of just go around them and that's bad. So you have to do something in that circle to make sure the packets don't just go into a circle. And luckily, Proxmox has a really nice guide on that. And I kind of followed some of their instructions here for the full mesh network for Ceph server. And they actually go over four different ways to do it here. I choose to use the fully routed setup using FRR. It seemed to work the best when it comes to very low downtime if you have a network failure working. And it's fairly easy to configure because it does a lot of things automatically. It just knows which hosts you're using and the network cards you give it. You create the subnet and IPs that they all have, and then it checks how many hops it has to do to get to it. For the IP setup on this network, I created its own subnet. And that way that all these three servers can talk to each other over a high-speed link, and that network doesn't have access to any other networks. The only data that's going to be going over it is Ceph data for doing the distributed file system and live migration data. Having a full mesh setup with 10 gigabit instead of having a switch has a few other possible advantages. There's no single point of failure. It's likely a bit lower latency because there's no switch in the middle. It's just one hop between the servers. Now let's go over some of the reasons to go with a cluster in Proxmox and some of the new features you get that you don't have on a single node. The first feature is just managing it all on one web page. If you had three separate nodes without a cluster, now you have three tabs to go through and it's just a bit more annoying. The next advantage is migration between systems. So you can easily move VMs running or not between different systems with limited downtime and it keeps all the configs. VMs can be configured with high availability. So if one of the nodes was to die, the VMs can get restarted on another node automatically. The other advantage is shared storage. This lets migrations happen much faster because it only has to copy the RAM or the config file, not the whole disk if it was on local storage. And it also makes some things a bit nicer because like your ISO files can be shared between all of your VMs. Let's take a look at that Ceph performance now. Here's a crystal disk mark run on the default settings. And the reads are fairly reasonable and the writes are quite bad. And the reason the writes are quite bad is it's doing synchronous writes. So that means before it can start the next write command, it has to have the hardware confirm it. It has to write to three systems, have all of the systems confirm the write, and then do the next I.O. request. You're gonna have to do something else to make this actually practical storage. One way is to put better hardware at the problem, but if you don't have access to that, I wanna do a bit of tweaking. And one thing that I thought could help was meshing around with cache settings. If you do write caching, you can make it so it doesn't actually have to fully wait for that write to finish before it tells the VM it's done. And here's the performance I get if I do that. Looking at the QDEP1 results, there's a massive improvement but it also means there's a potential for data loss if power is lost on the systems. The read performance is reasonably good, especially for sequential, because it's essentially working in a RAID 0, reading data from the three servers and combining it together. And Ceph pulls the same amount of data from each server at a given time. So in this case, because I got about 750 megabytes per second, each server was providing about 250 megabytes per second. But one thing I learned is on each node, you want to have all the drive sizes be identical because if they aren't, it's going to write to the drive that has more space more, essentially lowering the max performance of the cluster. And having more drives is better because it runs in parallel. A lot of Ceph stuff is the more different nodes you can throw at it, the faster you're going to get it going. But now that I have a reasonable cluster going, let's break that cluster and see how well it can handle failures. I'm back out at the servers now, and I'm going to intentionally make some hardware fail just to see how Proxmox and this cluster handles it. And the first thing I'm going to take a look at is drive failure and Ceph. I want to see how Ceph handles one drive failing. I just took this SSD out of the pool. Taking a look at the dashboard, I can see this quarter of data that is undersized, which means it has less copies than it wants. Luckily though, Ceph can put another copy of that data from the other systems in this rack onto these three SSDs that remain in it. And that's what it's doing right now. If I scroll down, I can see this recovery rebalance is going on. Now I'm going to take down one of the 10 gigabit network links and I want to see how well it can recover just using the other two links. Because it's using the fully routed setup, it should very quickly switch from using that failed link to using the other two links of data but I'm going to give it a challenge and I'm going to have a migration on that link at the same time. I just started the migration. I can see the progress going on down here and I just pulled the cable and let's see what happens. It looks like the speed has dropped a little bit, but oh, it's still going. Basically no downtime. 
I can migrate a VM and I have this cable here that just got unplugged that was carrying the data. Now I'm gonna test a node failure and see how the cluster holds up, how high availability works and how Ceph deals with this. The rest of the cluster, Ceph and all the other VMs should be able to continue working without any hitches. So here goes the plug. And now it just started my HA VM. My VM has relatively poor performance right now in terms of IO, likely because Ceph is doing a rebuild on one of their drives right now and it's also missing a node. So it's far from an optimal configuration, but it is still running. And I got my VM running after a node failure within about five to 10 minutes. Now the next test for me is powering this node back on and making sure it can join the cluster and the cluster can become a happy cluster again. Node number one is now powered up again and connected to the cluster. Proxmox seems fine with the node right now. And Ceph looks like it's working on putting all the data back in the right spot. And it looks like about now it's almost finished doing so. Now I'm gonna move VM100 back from node number two to node number one, just to see how that goes. And now my VM100 is running back on the original node it was running on. All the Ceph data is safe again, and the cluster is all working and communicating properly. Proxmox and Ceph handled these failures about as good as I could imagine. The drive failure resulted in no data loss and quickly started putting the data on other drives. The network link downage had no issue and didn't even stop a current TCP connection on that link and the node failure took down all the items on the node, but when it rebooted, it connected just fine, copied all the data again, and it didn't seem to have any issues because of the hard reboot. Now that I have all the hardware for a three node cluster, is there any other tests that you'd like to see? I could run other operating systems, I could do more tests with Proxmox, I'd love to just play around with clusters and see what I can do.